blown wood down into an open grave. Is there another way? Is there another way? And the rain pours heavy on the way. Hola, si estás viendo este vídeo, lo más probable es que tengas algo que decir sobre el futuro. Es más, seguramente tus decisiones puedan marcar la diferencia. Estos últimos meses han sido difíciles. Por suerte, la vida no se detuvo. Mientras nosotros estábamos estudiando, trabajando o incluso haciendo ejercicio, la naturaleza tuvo un respiro. La economía siguió, pero las emisiones de carbono bajaron. Nos conectamos y entendimos que la tecnología podía ayudarnos más de lo que pensábamos. Si hemos sido capaces de mantener el mundo entero en movimiento, ¿qué no seremos capaces de hacer? Estamos a tiempo de frenar el cambio climático y la digitalización es clave. Apostemos por un mundo en el que la tecnología nos ayude a cuidar el planeta. Me gustaría que mis hijos viviesen en un mundo sostenible, en equilibrio, sin emisiones contaminantes, donde cada recurso se cuide y se aproveche al máximo. Creo que no exagero si digo que nos va la vida en ello. Porque no nos engañemos, no tenemos otro planeta. El futuro es lo que hagamos ahora. Ya sé lo que estás pensando, que somos jóvenes ingenuos, soñadores, pero tú también has estado en nuestro lugar, ¿no? 
Tú también has soñado con pequeñas y grandes revoluciones y con un mundo mejor. Y es que después de lo que hemos pasado estos meses, ¿cómo no vamos a soñar despiertos? Yo prometo hacer mi parte para que esto ocurra, pero ahora necesito que tú hagas la tuya. Y es que es el momento de decidir si cambiamos o si simplemente seguimos repitiendo que todo va a cambiar. Depende de ti, de mí, de vosotros, de nosotros. ¿Nos ponemos a ello? Hello and to Telefonica's 12th global workshop on energy and climate change. My name is Catherine Bohill, and as director of ESG Development and Impact, it is my pleasure to moderate today's session. You see, for the last 12 years, Telefonica has been hosting this event. For the last 12 years, bringing together employees, suppliers and industry thinkers to stop and reflect and see how we can solve the massive problem that climate change is. This is an event which we hope will reflect positively on Telefonica. We want our customers, we want our shareholders, we want all stakeholders to know that we're working hard on climate, that we care. We want the market to know that it's certainly not a knee-jerk reaction after COP26. Telefonica cares, and we've been caring for a long time. But our objective for this event, it's not a public relations exercise. This is very much a workshop. And over the next days, we are taking out time out to reflect, identify, and most importantly, importantly, formulate concrete steps to take over the next 12 months. So Greta, if you're listening, this isn't blah, blah, blah. This is work, work, work. As the motto of our event says, if we change, the world changes. And to quote the great Irish-American statesman, JFK, ask not what your, what, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. It's about every one of us caring. It's about every one of us doing. And that includes our top management. Over the next three days, Members of our, of our executive committee are participating in the event, showing their commitment to the sustainability agenda. And this starts right here, right now. Please welcome to the stage to inaug inaugurate the event, our COO, Ángel Villa. Please, Ángel, if you can join me. Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Energy and Climate Change Workshop. It's a real pleasure to have all of you here, both in person and many more connected virtually. In the midst of the green and digital transitions, it is the time to take real action. The net zero economy is no longer in question. It is a shared responsibility of every society. Telefonica has a long track record building accountability, decarbonizing our own operations and our value chain and developing smart technologies. We are walking the talk. Today, we rank as one of the leading companies in sustainability. And we rank also as a benchmark in operational management, environmental management, including the A-list in the CDP. Let me share with you four trends 
and one final message. First trend, society is increasingly concerned about how companies behave. Consumers are embracing eco-friendly products and services and are adopting a more sustainable lifetime. lifestyle. Today, sustainability is important for 80% of the consumers worldwide. The pandemic has accelerated this trend. In fact, nearly two-thirds of consumers are willing to change their consumer habits and their purchasing habits to help reduce negative environmental change. Hence, companies must focus on sustainability as much as they do focus on strategy development, because it will be an important source of long-term competitive advantage. Second trend, ramping up digitalization is critical to decarbonize the global economy. The green and digital transitions go hand in hand, with digitalization powering the green transition. These twin transitions will accelerate the development of climate smart technologies which are necessary to achieve the net zero emission goals. Thanks to the next generation funds, we have the chance to further develop strategic sectors and technologies to achieve a net zero economy. Digital technologies and services can reduce global emissions between 15% and 35% by 2030. That is the equivalent of today's carbon footprint of the US and the European Union combined. Digitalization is unstoppable and is a synonymous of growth, of quality employment, of sustainability and inclusion. Countries and companies that do not digitize themselves will lose competitiveness. We have an extraordinary opportunity to transform the economies and the societies and to be more digital and greener while fostering a fairer transition that leaves nobody behind. Third trend. Sustainability is playing an increasing role in Telefonica. Businesses must lead the change when it comes to tackling the climate crisis. At Telefonica, we put ESG criteria at the heart of everything that we do, in the design of our networks and products, in the purchases, in the investments, and also in our variable compensation. We are committed to net zero emissions by 2025 in our key markets and by 2040 in all the footprint, including the value chain. This goal is fully aligned with the Paris Agreement. We are transforming our networks while turning off legacy. This journey started back in 2008 when we did the first fiber rollout in Spain and in 2019, we activated our first 5G sites in the UK. In Spain, by 2025, we will have replaced 100% of the copper network with fiber, which is 85% more efficient, and with 5G, which is 90% more efficient than 4G. Furthermore, we are transforming our operating model with 80% of our processes fully digitized or by including artificial intelligence capabilities in our services and in our call centers. Thanks to our strategy, we have stabilized energy consumption since 2015, in spite of multiplying by five, five-fold increase in our traffic. By 2025, energy consumption per traffic unit will be 90% lower than 10 years before, that is 2015. In the last two years, we have been using only renewable electricity in our main markets, and our goal is to be 100% renewable in ISPAM by 2030. Thanks to all of this, we have reduced our carbon emissions 
by 40%, including our value chain, in the last five years. Beyond our own transformation, we also help transform our customers and address their environmental challenges. We have our EcoSmart Cloud, IoT, Big Data, and Artificial Intelligence Services to reduce energy and water consumption, CO2 emissions, improve traffic planning and air quality, and boost the circular economy. Our ambition is to help our customers avoid 12 million tons of CO2 per year. Telefonica has been helping to build a greener and more sustainable society for more than a decade, being pioneers in addressing the energy and digital transition. And this has just begun. Ultrafast 5G connectivity and the solutions it will enable are expected to further cut carbon emissions across sectors. Fourth trend, investors are highly committed to sustainability. Investor support plays a central role to deploy the necessary infrastructure and develop, and develop cutting-edge technologies. The investor interest in our potential to decarbonize the economy has placed Telefonica as the largest green issuer in the ICT sector with capital flows increasing. We are an industry pioneer in sustainable financing. In 2019, we launched the first green bond. In, 19, in 2020, the first green hybrid bond. And in 2021, the industry's first sustainable hybrid bond. With the funds raised, we will finance projects that will benefit society contributing to sustainable development goals. These projects will focus on further transforming our network with sustainability as a cross-cutting element to build a digital and greener future. The company's intention is to have more than 10 billion euros of ESG financing in the following years, including capital markets and banking financing. More than 10 billion euros of GSC financing because investors are recognizing our meaningful role in the climate change goals and are financially supporting our initiatives. And now the final message. Global warming challenge needs a global action now. It is our collective responsibility to ensure we grab the opportunities that technology offers towards decarbonizing the economy. Telefonica is fully committed, and our contribution to protect the, planner, the planet can be a game changer. Thank you very much, and please do enjoy this workshop. Thank you, Angel. Indeed, how we help other sectors decarbonize, that is a game changer. But more on that later. First up, we want to get some logistics out of the way. Now, this event, we wanted to make it the, as interactive as possible. So if you would kindly send your questions via this platform, you can see the codes above and the QR code and send in your questions because, again, we want to involve you. We want to answer your questions either now or during the year. So keep them coming in. Next up, we have three speakers for you. Great speakers. They are going to provide us with an overview of how we integrate sustainability within the company, from the strategy to the how, the operations, and finally, how we transmit that via our products and services uh, to our customers. After, the three speakers will join me on a panel, and we look forward to fielding all those questions you're sending in to us. Our first panellist is Maya. 
Maya Ormazabal is Director of Environment and Human Rights. She is my colleague, but she has been passionately changing and making the company more greener over the past 20 years. Maya will share with us TEF's overriding sustainability strategy. She is indeed ready for net zero. And now we're ready for Maya. Maya, please take the floor. Thank you, Cathy. And thank you all for being with us today. I'm going to switch to Spanish. <laughs> so, um, como decía Cathy, la as Cathy was saying, this is about the strategy of Telefonica. Obviously, we're going to land a bit now as regards what we're talking about. But so, what is this path to net zero? Let's share together the context we're in and what we're doing for climate change to prevent it. And I think we should start with the scientists, the ones who know most about this. So we know that the temperature of the Earth has increased 1.1 degree. Uh, in comparison with pre-industrial times. So the scientists see consequences all over our geography. But we've got lots of good results as well, good news. We have to take urgent action, but we can revert the situation. We can avoid the worst circumstance, the worst consequences. So we have to change radically our emissions for 2025, reduce them to half for 2030. So this is not easy. But that's why we're working all together, uh, those of us who are here today. So governments. Governments, the scientists say, uh, are the ones that set these measures. So what are these measures and actions to make things happen? We know that we've been working with a lot of summits, the last one in Glasgow, the most recent. Ankela mentioned that. And the previous one was in Paris in 2015. And we've made a lot of progress there, and we've inverted this growth curve. It's, mu it's going much more slowly, but we still have a major gap between the commitments and action, and that's a reality. So what the analysts say of uh, that if we take all these commitments we have on the table and we start acting, we will. if we don't do that, we'll have more than an increase of two degrees, so every tenth of a point would be to have a huge effect on society at large and the planet. So all these actions are being passed on to regulatory measures. So we do have to wait for the coming years to see how we increase these measures. Uh, so what are we doing and seeing in the companies? We were a leader company, in my opinion because a lot of companies are having a tough time meeting those uh, commitments. So we, we want to be at this net zero by 2050 or before, if possible. So this is a campaign that arose last year, and a lot of multinationals have joined. But we have to get the whole business circuit involved in this movement. We also can see that companies are trying to change not just their operations, but to have an effect on their whole value chain. And from the point of view of investors, what are they doing? Well, a lot. We can see an increase in the amount of agreements on the part of investors to move capital and change from fossil fuels to more so more renewable and cleaner sources. So there's a substantial increase in the financial world and capital's markets in terms of sustainable finance. This is not just a trend, this is also shaping the finance for the future. We can also see investors are becoming much more transparent, transparent in their reporting systems. So at the end of the day, we're all citizens, and uh, there's a growing demand now for some years uh, uh, from the younger generations, uh, they're asking for these moves. What are we doing? And we need to be, in, those of us who are in a decision-making role have to do a lot more because uh, these young generations are asking for these changes to take place as soon as possible, not just the scientists. So we're all consumers. And as Angel said, we 
see a growing demand for sustainable products and sustainable companies committed to the environment. But let's look at this context in terms of Telefonica. When we think about climate change, we think about the risks. It's true that uh, we are meant there are many physical risks. Everybody thinks about those catastrophes, extreme climate manifestations. So we know that we have more opportunities than risk, but we, if we think of the physical events, we have fewer risks than with transition. The physical risks come, in our case, from the increase in temperature, which means we have to refrigerate more uh, to cool the equipment, etc. Uh, so. If we think of uh, floods also, they are a major factor. And in terms of transition, the risks come from a market, an increase in the cost of energy. This can affect us directly as a company. We're working on this too. And we want to convert these risks into opportunities. So we're working so that the OPEC, energy OPEX can take the Mo make the most of the opportunities for decarbonization by signing long-term agreements which will enable us to maintain our energy OPEX at more contained levels uh, and not at the cost of um, this, these changes in the market or, or subject to them. So this is an opportunity to increase our revenue because we'll have solutions that our customers and cities need in the energy sector and manufacturing sector also, and uh, through digitization. So Telefonica will have more opportunities than risks, but we are managing these risks carefully to be able to be ready to ha tackle them. So this, so what do we have to do in terms of a strategy for, uh, which will take us to this net zero? We start with some objectives, because this is what will mark down our route, our roadmap. So the objectives are very clear. We have a part focused on reducing our impact and one a part which in which means that our customers can more successfully decarbonize our own impact as Anka said, is to have a net zero company in 2025, the main market, and 2030 when we cover all our geographical areas. So we're going to do this through renewable energies, 100% for 2030 at the latest, and making our use of, of energy more efficient and per tra traffic over our network and also our carbon emissions need to be lined up with the strategies laid down with 35 percent at the third stage for 2025 neutralizing our permanent our uh, a lot of emissions for 2030 so our products and services how are we helping them to decarbonize will we are in Proving increasing their products so that we can avoid 12 tons, 12,000 tons uh, per year of carbon of CO2. So how can we see this in graphics from 2015 to 2040? That uh, we've been moving along this route from the start and work, working on this workshop, and it's not the first time many of you have been here. So for 2020, we had already reduced our emissions by. 71 percent, and depending on long distance or short distance. So, our products and services, our customers in 2019 were at emissions of 10,000 uh, tons. But 2020 was a very special year, uh, the COVID year, where digitization penetrated our world very much. So, so this will we won't maintain these levels of intensity, but we have advanced a great deal and we won't be moving backwards. So how are we going to reach the 12 million target? We're not just talking about objectives because without concrete measures, this will mean nothing. So we have to transform the whole company. And this is what we're doing. We're transforming the way that we operate and also the way we relate to our value chain. And 
thinking about the products and services of our customers. So this lines up with our zero, net zero strategy. So we'll take a few minutes for each of these questions as regards operations. The next operation uh, paper will go into this more, but I can say that we are moving more and more to more efficient technologies, managing to introduce energy efficiency projects to re to reduce the energy use in all our networks and we have a renewable plan uh, energy plan since 2006 looking at the reality of the geographies we work in and we are managing to fit in this consumption and this uh, the reduced use of co2 within our business so we know we must manage to maintain the reduction of use of energy and our emissions have been reduced by 61%. So we're bringing in many different useful elements like for to reduce the emissions of carbon, projects related to the circular economy. We have two major impacts from the environmental point of view, uh, climate change and all the consumption, the impact on the use of equipment and electronic uh, um, um, equipment. So this uh, will all move. We also have initiatives to reduce our carbon emissions and the initiatives uh, will offset our the danger of climate change to a great extent. So look, like looking at the value chain, this is very complex. First, we have to do is be allies with all our competitors in this. This is not a question of competition. This is doing it all together. We're working on different initiatives. We're in a coalition with the 17 most important companies in sustainability affecting the whole sector. So we're making major advances to work with our suppliers, all of you here today, to support you in this decarbonisation process with uh, initiatives go beyond, go beyond our sector because we need to have an effect in all areas of action. We are part of this SME Clap and Hub initiative and working with, to support the SMEs in their decarbonisation because the basis of the economy is SMEs and we know that we have to accompany them in this process. Internally, I, we have elements to do with uh, purchasing, carbon pricing, and total cost of ownership. So we have specific measures to work hand in hand with our key suppliers in the, this area. So our value chain, these emissions, uh, value chain, value chain emissions. Uh, it's almost 60% of our emissions come from this supply chain, but 35% come from the equipment, um, routers, decoders, and uh, set-top boxes, and all these, these technologies. We have to work on in that area to be able to that our suppliers consume less energy, the little as possible. So the circular economy, the reuse of all this equipment is fundamental. So. And the most important thing is our customer. A third point. So how are we providing these services so that our customers benefit from digitization and think, thinking particularly about environmental benefits? How do we help them to reduce their carbon emissions, consumption of water, or and promoting the circular economy? So working on different fronts there. The first of these would be to innovate and create new products and services. We've been thinking of this benefit and the impact that they need to create for the future. So another important element is scaling. We, ha we have to think that Internet of Things has reached its limit in digitization. No, no, this is not the case. Well, the more we scale, and we've seen this with COVID, we can achieve more benefits from digitization. So the third point more related to our B2C customers and some B2B is to provide information. We want to have our informed customers so that they know that they have a benefit by using a particular service. service. So there are two examples of this. The, the Koshmark, which is a business de cuál es el beneficio to be service. So the then the cell curating 
it provides information to the customer on the impact, the environmental impact of each call. So this is these are co uh, labels, as it were, and something that the customers can't do on their own. And the last thing to say, and the most important, is the organisation. How can we transform this? This is not something we can do through operations and sustainability. This has to be cross-sectional, across the whole company. So most important thing is that the government of sustainability must work at the highest level. Our executive committee, our board form part of the decision-making process for to achieve net zero. And also our variable uh, remuneration brings in a percentage linked to climate change, the objectives that we meet or not in each of our operators. This is linked to the remuneration, to the pay of each uh, person involved. So we have made a change in the model of debt uh, emission. This is related also to specific pro social projects and environmental projects. 3.2 billion of the company is sustainable, sustainable uh, earnings related to projects that reduce the carbon footprint and uh, incorporate further digitization. So this whole project, all these, all this strategy of the company uh, has meant that over the last seven years we have worked very transparently and very completely transmitting this information. So please allow me just to finish with a, a, a clear message. Our objectives are our pillar, the centre that will mark out, mark out our roadmap. But what's important is not just this pillar, but also what we do with it, the path that we follow to achieve these objectives. So I think Telefonica is clear that they must do this with others to have an effect on the suppliers, our customers, our employees, because we know that only working together, all of us, can we meet those challenges. One company working on its own can't do that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maya. Would you like to join me here? Thank you, Kathy. Waiting for our panel. Um, yes, you can hear the passion that Maya uses in her daily job, but also I think if you can hear the urgency that we need to do more, right? So next up, um, we have Juan Manuel Caro. Uh, Juan Ma is Director of Operational Transformation, reporting directly to Telefonica's Chief Technology and Information Officer. Juan Ma is a a key ally to making sure that this sustainability agenda is a hot topic for the company for more than a decade. I won't give his age away. Um, and uh, we're really grateful to him and to his team. Um, he is a transformer. It's not just in the title. And Wama is going to tell us uh, today about how we're reducing our uh, emissions and some of the achievements to date. Thank you, Wanwa. Thank you ever so much for that introduction about me being a transformer and not giving my age away. Thank you. Well, this is my 10th workshop and my presentation kind of like uh, takes stock of the company and how the year has been for us and we have met the objectives that we set last year or a couple of years ago and how we're doing things and what we're going to do in the future and always with more ambitious objectives too. So it's a pleasure to be here again and let's begin. So this year the presentation is going to focus on how we're reducing emissions in Telefonica. So a first reminder, not for those of you in the room, but uh, how we classify the emissions in a company such as Telefonica. We have uh, scope one emissions that are directly com controlled by the operator, but the others uh, are up there as well. We have the fuel from our fleet, what we use in the operations, in the electrogens or the uh, 
generators and uh, air conditioning and we will see how we work with them and what objectives we want to achieve. As for scope 2, this is for electricity consumption by the company and we can see how we're doing there too. And then there's scope 3 which will be the focus of the presentation and this has to do with the value chain and what is used for all the products and services that we buy, that we sell, or our business trips that are not under our direct control, but we are working on them and uh, will be touched in upon in the presentation. So what is our footprint? Well, we're a big achiever, but how are we doing in emissions? Well, this is the, what we have up since 2050. This uh, first... Uh, um, View looks good. We've reduced uh, on 61% in scopes one and two in the last six years, and uh, scope one 28%, scope two 77%. And you can see how this is distributed. Oh, Germany has the fewest emissions, and we have three operators: the UK, Spain, and Brazil that have similar emissions. And then we have Hispam, which has much higher emissions. And it's not because they've done a worse job, but simply because we're in a lot of markets and there's access to certificates. They don't have as much access to certificates and uh, uh, other plans that Europe has access to. So. The first message is let's we are going along the in the right direction and at the end of the year we always uh, have a scoop how's 2021 we've only got one month left to close well 2021 if we're at 750 kilos per tons by 2020 21 will uh, drop another 100 at 650 will be at so it's a good uh, we're going in the right direction, so congratulations, because the work we've done this year has been very effective, and as I say, we are moving in the right direction, but it is not enough. So let's look at scope one and scope two emissions, and as I said, the scope one emissions are basically these three. And we're looking to see the emissions that are generated. In telecommunications, we need to cool. We have 200,000 sites, and a lot of equipment can't work at these high temperatures. So this is a core part of our business. What are we doing to reduce emissions? Well, we are working a great deal, mainly, firstly, on the process, more than 200,000 sites, a lot of them with cooling, air conditioning, not all of them, but we're working on digitizing that process, understanding where there are leaks, so using AI or predictive systems that uh, will help us act on time so that we can measure things more easily because it's not straightforward. We need to see how much many leaks there are. And all of these improvements in the process are allowing us to get to know where these leaks are and to work as we have seen in on these uh, uh, things every year. And we're increasingly using gases that have a less of an environmental impact. They're not so bad for, as for the atmosphere because the technology is advancing and we need to use those that are least harmful. So that's the first task. Um, we have to ref re we have to cool the equipment. We can't use equipment that doesn't need cooling. So we have to make this, uh, do this as efficiently as possible. And what are we doing here? Well, in the last few years, we have been using free cooling systems and we've using ventilators where possible. And we've installed more than 3,000 systems of this, eliminating cooling and air conditioning. And we're also working on innovative solutions such as this one. This is a liquid cooling and the air conditioning is replaced in this manner. So this is being tested in Spain and other technologies are being tested too, but always with the aim of reducing pollution from um, polluting gases. Another source of emissions is uh, operational fuels or gasoline. We have sites all over Spain, ones in the center of Madrid, others in uh, forests and other things that are outside the grid, outside the um, scope of electricity companies and we have to provide telecommunication services in fact they're essential for the lives of people who live remotely so what we're trying to do here is build sites that can uh, they are hybrid systems as you can see here to get rid of the uh, generators that we use all the time 
We have more than 500 of these in different sites, and these uh, are self-generated with sun power or wind power. And we also have other sites because even though they may be in places where there's electricity, it's not good quality. There are frequent cuts and blackouts, so we can't allow to, uh, for having blackouts and leaving people without services because that's critical. All telecommunications are critical in these parts of the world. So we have pumps, or rather generators, and what we're doing is a clear analysis of these p places, and some of the blackouts aren't so long. So we use more lithium batteries there so that we can get rid of these generators. And if they're not long blackouts, then we don't have to even switch on these generators. And we have the example in Colombia where we used 500,000 litres of uh, fuel oil, and that is example of work that's being done in the different countries. Another source of consumption are the portable generators. We use these uh, generators, and in some cases, there's a project in Peru where we're taking backup batteries instead of generators. So we're always trying to consume le the least diesel possible. Also, there's gasoline for the fleet of cars. We have lots of technical people all over the world in different countries um, driving around. Um, and we've reduced 40% of consumption in these fleets. And we are working on many fronts here in terms of technology. And fiber uses the half, half of copper. so the Change, uh, technology change reduces consumption. We are using AI automation uh, so that problems can solve themselves without the need of technical people. We are using products that are least harmful, such as biodiesel, and we are fleeting, uh, managing electric fleets now. And by 2030, we want to have a full fleet, 100% fleet, electrical fleet, and we'd reduce diesel drastically in our fleets like this. And as for scope two, which is uh, the electricity that we consume, here you can see the distribution. You will have seen before that we've reduced this by more than 60% in the last few years, the emissions because of this. And as you know, we are t totally renewable in the main markets, but we also have a lot more to do. As you can see here, there's a distribution in our geographies, and we're working basically on along two lines. One is to reduce consumption. Uh, then like that you don't pollute. And secondly, we want to do so. What we do consume has to be from renewable sources. And as for efficiency projects, the reduction of consumption, well, as you well know, we have a global center where all operators work together in order to design and execute projects uh, that uh, uh, to avoid energy crisis. And in the last few um, months, so we've reached more than 200, and we've had an impact on our accounts. This is measured in euros of almost 1 billion euros in savings in energy efficiency for the company. So apart from the benefits for the environment, for the company, the environment too, um, it benefits and our accounts and the profit and loss account too. So as you can see, the con these are the concepts that we're working on, replacing obsolete technologies in the network and uh, cabins and taking out cooling, using free cooling, buying in different ways, buying using PPAs, changing the lighting systems and bulbs. And there's more than a 1,000 projects out there. And as you can imagine, they're ad hoc projects that we're working on in all different fronts in the chain. And I think very successfully, we're trying to reach a 1,000, but we can round up and say it's going to be 1 billion in savings. And then we can celebrate next year. But anyhow, it's a really great job. And these projects and the management that we're doing is allowing us to well see traffic that's increased by five times in our network since 2015. As you can see, the last peak in 2020, uh, where we stayed at home, teleworking, watching series, and traffic increased. And, but we've managed to um, maintain consumption flat, but even reduce it by 1%. So what happened in 2021? How are we going to close the year? Well, the 2021 was also a year of a great deal of traffic. Traffic was going to increase by 6 for this year, and energy will close at minus 2%. So we've managed to contain even more so the growth of traffic. So 
Really, it's a spectacular job, and I'd like to thank you all for that. We are achieving something which, for me, I thought was practically impossible. Um, with all the projects that we're doing and all the objectives we have for the future, it will continue to be possible, hopefully. So the next message within scope two, we've talked about energy efficiency, consuming less, and the other part is we're going to consume renewable energies. And that is the way forward as from 2015. You'll see in the first few years there's been high growth. As I said, from 2019, we're 100% renewable in the four main markets. Last year, 2020, we also achieved this in Peru. So congratulations. Welcome to the club of the 100% renewables. And we're making progress in other countries in his spam. And as I said, it's not straightforward. This is market allows us to buy. It's not a market that allows us to buy certificates of renewable energies. So those markets have to mature. So our objective is to be 100% renewable by 2030. And we, this year, we've increased this by a point. And we are, as I say, going in the right direction. But it's a big macro job. We do not conform with the CPI of being renewable. We're 88% renewable. But we don't want to only have a certificate that ensures that the energy that we achieve is certified that it's renewable. That's great, but we also want to help the societies or companies where we work. So we're not going to conform just to that. In the lighter blue, it's the purchase of certificates. That's the best short-term so solution to ensure we are renewables. But we also want to uh, make um, uh, advance. And uh, so in the country, we commit our consumption to create a new park. And so it's a wind farm, solar park farm, and we can consume from that park. And our KPI won't increase, but we are helping to ensure that uh, the, that uh, this uh, improves, not, and that there will be increasingly renewable energies. And we think that that is a good practice. It maintains a more stable price, and I think we all come out winning. And as you can see, we've started doing things in 2021, which I'll tell you about. But the strategy for the next few years is to reach more long-term agreements for new PPAs and parts and plants, and we have a few more details later to come. So these are two examples of purchases of this type that we've executed in 2021. You probably saw them on the news. One is a long-term uh, agreement for 582 gigawatts per year. This is a private, uh, uh, biggest uh, private agreement and uh, long-term for the country. And it's several facilities which will have direct consumption from renewable facilities for Telefonica Spain. The second one is in Brazil. It's a bit bigger, 711 gigawatts per year, uh, per hour per year. And 83 facilities will be created all over Brazil, which will be into 30 sites. And for all the regions, this is an investment that has been made. These are facilities that have been created. And we were already renewable, but with this, we're going to be even closer to self-generation, to generate closer to where we need it. So you will see more of this in the news in the next few years, if everything goes well. Finally. Where are we in terms of net zero? You've seen what the objectives are that we've heard about 2025 to be net zero um, and to in 2040 to be neutral. So how are we doing with scopes one and two? Well, as I said, we're doing well. We're close to 650 this year. And in the end, with the objective of reducing by 80% the emissions in scope one and two by 2030. We have a great deal to work on and to reduce consumption and emissions, but what we can't um, reduce, we will offset this with the CO2 absorption projects that Maya talked to us about before. So therefore, as a conclusion, I think that we've done a great job in 2021. And once again, I'm very pleased that I never have to come up here to tell you all off. Those people from Telefonica who know about this and you from Telefonica know about this. But good, congratulations. 2021 has been a very good year. We've come close to our objectives. We have some ambitious projects in the short term in 2025, 2030, and 2040. Some of us, they're closer to being achieved. Others need a great deal of work. 
together with countries, but we have the team, we have the resources, we have the vocation and the objectives and our boss. We've seen Angel that is on board, Enrique too, on Thursday, and all the um, XCOM is involved, so we can't fail. Thank you very much to all of you, and it's a pleasure as usual. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. I'm, I'm staying with the uh, 993 million. That's a hell of a lot of money. I think it brings home that being good to the planet is always be also being good to our bottom line. So now for our next guest, uh, Elena Hill will join us now. Elena is Global Director of Product and Business Operations at Telefonica Tech, IoT and Big Data. Elena has extensive experience in um, helping governments and enterprises, our customers, on their way to digitally transform. And today she's going to share with us how our products and services are helping our customers reduce their environmental um, and carbon footprint. Okay, thank you, Elena. Go ahead. Muchas gracias, Cathy. Thank you very much, Cathy, and good afternoon to everybody. It's great to be here today. For me, it's the first time, and I hope not the last one. So as Cathy was saying, what we're going to do is complement what you've already heard with a view of what we're doing in Telefonica to help other companies in their own decarbonisation process using the technology. Because what's clear is that in this race to achieve the objectives of sustainability, companies are taking a lead. And they're doing it, as they should, lining up different groups of interest groups to be able to create more synergies and be more lined up going for the same objectives. And there's some uh, initiatives I'd like to talk about. The Brace to Z Race to Zero. This is promoted by the United Nations and brings together more than 5,000 companies, more than 1,000 cities to achieve these uh, objectives of reducing the emissions to half by 2030 or the initiative science-based target. It groups 2,000 different initiatives led by different institutions and what they do is they group together committed companies in complying with the agreements of Paris uh, not to increase global heating more than one uh, by a certain uh, degree so something that's very important here is the technology technology as commented by Angel in his introduction is something that will improve, will enable us to meet those objectives of a sustainable society. We calculate that this may enable us to reduce the emissions by 15 to 35 percent. 15, if we bear in mind only the industrial part, the economic factor, but up to 35 percent if we include also the impact this has on the behavior of individual individuals. So technology has a huge impact, as we heard from Juan, uh, how we're doing this in Telefonica, uh, impact on the reduction of energy use, consumption of water and the circular economy, and the CO2 emissions. So this is why Telefonica, through Telefonica Tech, which is the company where we bring together all these digital technologies which help our corporate customers on the one hand to be able to go through their own digital transformation and be more uh, efficient but also to be more sustainable because we are combining those technologies that are the most powerful particularly connectivity 5g will play a major role there and there are technologies like iot internet of things enables us to digitize the physical world that means connect up the physical world with internet so we can measure we can automate and we can do many different things we can talk we can be talking about vehicles or metering uh, 
many advisors, different companies. So IoT has a vital role to play in sustainability and the reduction of emissions. So we, if we are also able to combine IoT with, it, with big data and uh, artificial intelligence, we can extract value from all the data produced there. And we can help companies to take better decisions. Thanks to big data, artificial intelligence, companies can use this data not just to describe what has happened or what is happening, but also to predict and take decisions ahead of time. So we're talking about reducing admissions, optimizing uh, routes, etc. And also the technologies that are very important, the question of cloud and cyber security. So we've seen that all this question of teleworking, the ability of individuals to educate themselves remotely, to work remotely, reduces significantly the emissions in general and contributes to sustainability. So with all these technologies, all these combinations, as Maya said, we are very proud of the fact that Telefonica has been a pioneer in emitting or producing a postmark where we list all our services and products for companies with an external auditor. So we're able to communicate to our customers the ser services that are helping them in their decarbonization processes, energy saving, reduction of water use, ex circular economy or CO2 emissions. So this postmark, as we call it, uh, we launched in Spain and we're going to do this in, uh, in Brazil and possibly later on in other countries. It will help us, first of all, to communicate this information so that customers know what services products will help them to meet those objectives but also this is something that helps us to to raise awareness in our organization and we're introducing this uh, stamp or postmark for all our products and services so this is something that we have to look at right from the concept of our uh, of our own products and services right from the start. So combining these uh, services, we can help different companies, different sectors and different cities to connect up and extract value from that data to be a more sustainable society. As we've said, the pandemic has been an accelerator uh, and has had many negative consequences, of course, but of the few positive ones, it's been an accelerator of the use of technologies in moving towards the digitization of companies and the need to take remote decisions, automating processes, reducing the need to physically move from one place to another. So our objective as a company to help other companies uh, by it to the amount of 12 million uh, tons of uh, carbon. This is our objective to reach. We've managed to save 9.1 million euros. And this is something that we continue to move forward with. And we will save more as we gradually introduce more pro digital products uh, amongst our customers and we can expand their use. And I'd like to finish with one or two examples of how our services are contributing to this objective of improving sustainability. And one of them has to do with the smart meters. The, we are helping companies that manage gas, water, electricity, thanks to this combination of IoT sensors, in this case with narrowband uh, sensors, IoT. So we can provide these, um, these meters and we're really seeing fantastic results there, reducing up to 40% the losses, 20% the expenses in uh, operations and maintenance and 15% in energy saving. And another great example is the cities. 
as we said, they are being connected with different sensors, or with all sorts of things like lampposts and traffic lights and buses are being connected up through these sensors. And this is contributing to make to major savings for cities, but also savings which are sustainable. 10% of reduction in the in the production of urban waste and 70% of saving in uh, lighting in cities, city illumination. So uh, then everything to do with mobility is another area, uh, fleet management. For example, in Telefonica, we have more than 2 million connected vehicles, which can optimize their savings in on routes and on fuel. Thanks to 5G, there will be more optimization on these routes, the routes that these vehicles move along. So we're very proud that we have the first case of a tunnel connected with 5G, the A6 in Galicia, which is will be expanded, and this will be a major advance in terms of mobility, not, not just for the vehicles, but also thinking about all types of smart roads and motorways. So this is producing savings such as the reduction of 60% in bottlenecks, and traffic jams and major savings in fuel use and also reduction in 15 percent of co2 emissions and lastly another sector that is also benefiting greatly from the digital technologies is agriculture this is something that's vital it's one of the sectors which combines all different skills and capacities, sensors, connectivity, the use of the the full use of uh, smart uh, intelligent technologies, extracting the greatest benefits. We have one of the greatest strawberry producers, and this particular group have reduced their use of water by 90% because they've been able to produce. Uh, to have very controlled in, uh, internal vertical uh, um, surroundings or um, locations to be able to use the water best. So we're very committed in Telefonica to continue ha helping companies in all sorts of sectors and this in this objective of being more sustainable and reducing emissions. Thank you very much. Gracias, Elena. Gracias, Elena. Muy interesante. Vamos. Thank you, Elena. Very interesting. This is really especially interesting for me to hear the examples, very specific examples. So are you, I'm very pleasantly surprised. If you haven't, if you have noticed, I've changed to Spanish, but you can still hear my accent through it. So we'll have a chat. And there are lots of questions that have come in. But as I'm going to be the moderator, I can take some decisions there. So I'm going to ask a question, first of all. An investor asked me this the other day. One, uh, it's been a bit tricky, I think. This is Maya, oh, this is for Maya. So our sector creates a lot of products, which are electronic. How, what, are we going to change everything? Are we going to change mobiles every three years? Are we going to provide incentive for this? Are we going to change the routers? What is Telefonica doing in that area? Okay, thank you for your question, Cathy. Not an easy question to answer, but Telefonica consumes a lot of electronic equipment in our own network and also in uh, our customers, our customers are using a lot of those. So we think of energy, the best equipment is what uses least, but it makes, a, it makes it essential for us to have electronic equipment. So what we're doing, we've not been doing this so long, but we've de designing those 
that equipment better with our best suppliers who are experts in this, the routers, the decoders, etc., set-top boxes, thinking of the minimal use, thinking of the plastic, the material, everything consumed there so it is as little as possible, and then reusing, of course designing and re and reducing so reduction comes from reuse we reuse a great deal of the equipment in the network if we're dismounting a network in one country we can take that away to another country or we can sell it or we can manage it through a third operator so always in this order design reduce reuse and then recycle so we recycle 95 percent of the uh, of the waste we produce in the company we are a company that are really going to be zero waste this is our aim this is the path we're following okay thank you very much okay i've taken note okay next question so what is what are the impacts in terms of energy and climate change of the new technologies like fiber, 5G, and edge computing. This is for Juan Manuel. Uh, are we? Are they very green? Well, we have good uh, news there. The truth is that the industry is working a great deal. Our suppliers uh, with to make the new equipment more and more uh, effective efficient. We're always pushing with all our manufacturers and suppliers to make sure this is the case. As Angel said before, fiber is 85% more effective uh, than than copper per um, per customer. Uh, 5G is 90% more efficient than 4G in traffic. And then, by definition, uh, they are more efficient across the board. So this means that the new traffic that goes through the network consumes less. So this is fine, but if we don't take away the old technologies, we're not really going to achieve anything. So from Telefonica, we're working to deploy uh, fiber, but to remove copper. So this, so we have, uh, we're going, we're going to have be. 100% fiber for 2025. We're saving a lot of money there. So we're deploying 5G in our mar key markets, but we must try to, to um, switch off 2G, 3G, 4G. Uh, uh, in Germany, for example, they're going to turn off 3G. So t w moving all this traffic to 5G will make us much more effective. The new technology, the good news is that we are more efficient. Is it sufficient? Well, if we buy the technology from the market, from our suppliers, we have to concentrate in the way that this is designed. The network we have must, when we started deploying copper, copper, perhaps sustainability wasn't the core or idea of designers at that time, and not the same as now. So in this network, we are deploying 5G fiber. We're going to virtualize it in the cloud. This is the future for 2030. So this should be the technology for the next decades. It's a major technological change that we haven't had in 100 years. So when 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 we go to a 5G site, we modernize the place, we modernize all the installations there, apart from doing the installation. So what will this network be like in the future? We 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 will be remembered as as perhaps who created this sustainable uh, design. This so. I think it's very important, the principles of construction, smart site, the design of the whole grid of network is at the core of the design principles now, the experience of the customers, the technical criteria. So this new network that we are deploying will definitely make us much more sustainable ourselves and also our customers. Okay, thank you very much. And Elena? Juanma has explained the, that the new technologies are much more efficient, but what is the impact that they can have on society at large? And what can you comment on in terms of products and services for society? Well, I think there'll be very direct com 
impact, but will also ability to bring in new services and products that will bring benefits in sustainability. So, for example, 5G, which is with the increase of speed, you have a lower, low latency, more devices connected up. You can, this gives us IoT. So, it's demonstrated clearly that, and there's a study by Accenture that certifies that 5G contributes to reduction, 20% reduction of emissions in comparison with other cordless um, wireless technologies. So as part from that direct effect, we have the indirect effect due to all the technologies that are able to function as a result. So it's true what um, Juan Ma said, uh, you have to be ready and able to switch off the old ones because that's a fundamental part of it, to be able to substitute these technologies and remove the, previous, the old ones. Okay, this was like a class we'd taken each pupil. Okay, I have a question from COP on COP26, as Maya was there. First question, did you understand the Glasgow accent was the first question. Well, my accent doesn't seem that bad in comparison with uh, Glasgow. Is that not true? Well, it was quite hard, yes. So, okay. In COP26, uh, uh, an internal agreement was reached on the voluntary market in terms of uh, emissions rights. Can you tell us a bit more what the strategy of Telefonica will be to neutralize their emissions, their um the excess. So, well, the excess, we cannot have net zero emissions yet because as one, well, we have the question of refrigeration of the cooling and other questions. So, there is uh, an excess or a left, an element left over. So, these emissions, what we've, uh, we've committed ourselves to move carbon in the atmosphere and the use methodologies which are being developed to be able to adopt nature-based uh, text not technologies based on ecosystems so that we can so that the we can have collateral benefits created in nature as a result so these are nature-based solutions in uh, rural areas. So simplifying a bit, these would be projects which are uh, reforestation, for example. So that'd be a tree project in a rural, Spanish rural setting or in Brazil. But it's true that as these are technologies that are evolving at this moment, we are always open to see what opportunities are appearing to protect marine ecosystems, land, etc., whatever Telefonica can contribute. So apart from uh, reducing emissions, we want to have collateral positive impacts. There's a question here on eco-smart services. I love this because this was an inv inv invention by, of Telefonica, wasn't it? I was. I heard this. So we've heard that. I'm going to ask Elena about this, in fact, because we've talked a lot about Echo Smart, but how many products and services come under this category of Echo Smart? Well, as you say, we were the pioneer in doing this. So we revised and reviewed all our products and services to see which contribute to uh, reduction of energy use, water, uh, circular economy and emissions. And we're, this is not us saying this, it's an external auditor that certifies which products can really fit into this category and have this uh, postmark. So in 2019, we this is what we've completed so far. It, it's been 50 percent or 52 percent of our products have one of those of those seals so so we're 
expanding this to Vivo in Brazil and to, we'll be expanding it to other countries. So where we most contribute is in the energy part and also emissions of CO2. But as we have more products and we gradually extend, extend this percentage, this will grow, our participation will be more. And we feel very happy with the commitment that we made with our customers. So it's very important, this nuance, because as, although we've invented this, we have to continue work, working on this, on this, the use of this seal and expending the products that have this seal. One more question, and this is for oh, Elena. You sell this, but I'm going to ask Juanma because so the question is, how do these artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies help us to improve sustainability in Telefonica? I don't know whether to pass it on to you or what. Well, we have a great project for the use of these technologies in, in responsible use of technologies. and So particularly in energy, to give you some details, we have a dream, as it were, something that we look forward to achieving is zero, zero bits, zero, zero bats. So this is to uh, reduce the traffic, the, can, the, the zero, zero watts that was, bits and watts. So we hope to really improve that. The equipment must be more and more smart, and a lot of them have uh, inter artificial intelligence already incorporated. Um, so we must be able to really switch off when anything we don't need. And this is where this technology comes in and it switches on when needed. So this is power saving features. Many of our, much of our equipment has this and we have to work a lot on 5G in that area so that this is more the industry side, but then these technologies evolve pro operating projects self-heal. Where there's a failure or an outage of some type, then there's a self-healing process. Uh, it doesn't work for everything, but they. So it, we're applying this so that it, a problem can be resolved. The equipment can react. And we can see we can reroute the traffic uh, elsewhere, so that this can this can be part of the configuration. We can save a lot of journeys of, from our technical staff to go and sort uh, mend equipment, etc. So this is self correction of the network, saving all this uh, all these journeys. So that would make us more sustain sustainable. Self configuration. We're also applying to avoid uh, all these trips. And so in the field, we have router planners to make more effective, design more effective routes, saving petrol. So at all stages, the operation, not just how we construct the uh, grid, the network, we, this will be vital. These technologies, reducing technolo uh, um, time used by technicians. This is a new technology, of course, and it has a long way to go. But this is a huge project that we've taken on board in, in Telefonica with a lot of possibilities. And with the transformer, we'll, uh, it's great. It'll be great for the CV, all this information. So thank you very much indeed. We've received a lot of questions, but we, and we'll continue to answer questions in writing because we haven't got time. And I'm going to thank Elena, Juanma, for your time, and Maya. I'm going to ask you to stay on this stage because the next guest we'll, we'll have here uh, on the video. Thank you very much. Bueno, muchas gracias a, a todos por, por Thank you very much for being here still and up to this point the presentations of Telefonica have been aspiring we hope and we'd like to invite the next speakers who will help us each one within their area of expertise to see how we're advancing 
and what is outside Telefónica Spain. So the first square uh, speaker is Maria Mandiluce from Women Business, Business Coalition. This coalition is made up of uh, the key organisations on sustainability. The, this is B Team CP, CP and we have Maria here. So this is the World Business Council for Sustainable Development that has been working on sustainability for more than 25 years. It's a benchmark at uh, world level and for me it's great pleasure to have you here. Maria, I won't reveal the content of your presentation because you're going to give it yourself. Thank you very much for being here today. After a small, we'll have a little round of questions, so I'd encourage you all to ask a question. So, Maria, everyone will see your presentation on screen. Thank you. Gracias, Maria. Thank you very much, Maria. I hope you can hear me all right. And it's a pleasure, it's a shame I'm not here with you, but I would have loved to have been in Madrid. And anyway, I've reduced my carbon footprint quite considerably by not going. Well, as has been said, as you can hear, I'm Spanish, but I spent quite a long time living in Geneva. And you'll be able to see who some of our partners are there. Our organization has a theory about change, which means that if we bring or if the companies we work with increase their ambition in terms of zero emissions, we can talk to the governments and incentivize them to ensure that they have more ambitious, um, they're more ambitious in terms of climate uh, change. And so this means that there's more political and business ambition and that there's more progress made in the reduction of emissions. And this has been put into practice on many occasions and is bringing in very good results. We received uh, money from foundations and distributed that money in different initiatives and you'll be able to see some of those that we have the SMS Planet Hub, the controlled partnership, ambition, etc. These are some of the ambitions, uh, the initiatives and there are about 15 to 20 initiatives. In terms of climate change, it's clear that we have to act now. Climate change is not an ideology or a theory. It's a, it's a fact. And we aren't doing well. We want to maintain the increase in temperatures under 2 degrees C, which is what we agreed on in Paris. Not only that, a couple of years later, the International Panel on Climate Change, which is a group of scientists that studies climate change, they said that 2 degrees was too much and that it was necessary to reduce emissions so that the temperature would not surpass 1.5 degrees. That will make let me change the perspective, uh, has made me change the perspective and uh, accelerate some of the perspectives of the government and companies and to be more ambitious. This is out on the street, Fridays for Future. There are a series of movements, society's movements, that says that we have to act now. This was clear in Glasgow, too, where there were demonstrations out on the street. Young people who work in Telefonica with me, with suppliers, who are saying they want a better future, a cleaner future, because we have so much information that it forces us to act because we know that we are bringing about climate change and it's our fault and we are giving our children this responsibility, leaving this responsibility for future generations. So 
the energy crisis is having a significant impact on society. Energy prices are growing significantly. And what is clear is that if we could, we should accelerate this energy transition as much as possible because it would avoid a lot of the volatility we're seeing in the markets. So therefore, in this context, context we m met in Glasgow. We were talking after a lot of video conferences, and I think that the Glasgow conference was a success. I don't know what you will have read in the in the press and the media. I know that uh, they di didn't give that impression, but in the last 14 years, there are some conferences that are good and others that are bad. And I think that this was good, like the Paris one was, because the French government at the time and the British government took it very seriously and they negotiated for two years for those agreements. Because you've got to take into account that in Glasgow there were 195 countries that agreed on things that hadn't been agreed upon ever at a COP meeting, and that's fairly significant. But of course, the emissions continue to grow. So there is a certain amount of frustration on behalf of different sectors and the media. And, you know, how can you be so positive, therefore, if emissions are growing, people ask. And it is clear that we hope that what was agreed upon in Glasgow will re lead us to emission reductions. But I'm going to analyze this so that you can I mean, it's a bit technical, but so you can understand this. The first thing is this change from 2 degrees to 1.5 materialized in the official documents. 195 countries agreed that 1.5 would now be the objective. And it was recognized that the reduction plans of countries were insufficient. The NDCs were insufficient. but. They decided that a year more would be given to countries for them to present the reduction plans and the NDCs. So according to the maths, in order to achieve this objective, it was necessary to reduce emissions by half by 2030. That's in eight years' time. And this is what the European Union has said. This 55% reduction for 2030, the United States has said 52%, the United Kingdom 68%. And the thing is, is that there are many countries that have not given those levels. Uh, there's China that's talking about zero emissions uh, uh, for 2060, etc. So it may not seem good. It's actually great because up until now, China and India had not committed to anything. So for China to set an objective, they tend to um, meet these objectives before time, and it's their first objective. And as you can see, all the objectives then are improved upon. The next matter is that there will be a meeting in a couple of years' time when there will be a stock-taking exercise, and we can see where we're situated. Another important thing was Article 6 of the emissions market and an agreement was reached. And this is very complicated because this means that countries can invest in other countries for the reduction of emissions in that other country, but will be able to validate those emission reductions. Um, and so it was necessary to ensure that it, the reduction of emissions wasn't accounted for twice and that countries should contribute to reducing more emissions than normal, etc. And this is why we took so long in reaching the agreement. And then there are a couple of things in terms of the 100 million that were promised uh, in the meeting in Cancun 10 years ago, and developed countries did not meet these objectives. And that is because the developed countries said to developing countries that they would get financing to be able to adopt mitigation plans, etc. But the adaptation uh, is something that developing countries 
and particularly vulnerable countries are, who are impacted by climate change, they're requesting that they be helped, that they get money, that they should have technical capabilities given to them to adapt to climate change. And this is, will be a precursor to many mm, global crises because some of these islands and the increase in sea levels will cover these islands. It will cause forced migration. There will be many problems. So it would be a good idea if countries were to help the more vulnerable countries to face up to climate change and to build this resilience. So in total, the verdict is that COP was fairly positive and the direction is very clearly marked for companies and governments. The problem is, is that the speed and the amounts put for the implementation of these plans is insufficient. And so we need to strengthen this objective that we have to reduce the emissions by half by 2030 and we th need to bring this into companies. I have presented what happened to you in Paris and, uh, and so in summary, and so you see things in perspective. When we went to Paris in 2015, emissions had an increase in temperature of 3.7 degrees. That was foreseen in 2020 throughout the different years with the different plans for the reduction of emissions in countries. It was reduced to 2.6. And after the COP meeting, up till 2030, it was foreseen it would be 2.3, but up until 2050, it would be 1.8. What does this mean? That there is less ambition for the short term, but greater ambition in the long term. And in dropping this to 1.8, I mean, I feel personally quite happy with where the levels of ambition lie, taking into account that Paris was negotiated where we were under two degrees, and so we have to take to 1.5, and in particular, we need to provide results. So next slide, please. This is the global image. Next slide. So what does this mean for companies? Well, I'll go to more specific things. These things affect each of us. So as companies, what we're saying in this coalition is that every company has to show the greatest level of ambition. And this is being seen. I mean, there are companies that are saying zero emissions from now. Companies have COP1 and 2. And then there's the supply chain. Oh, so there's scope 1 and 2, sorry, and then scope 3. Where the problem lies, or where there's greater difficulties in reducing emissions, is in the supply chain, because that is not within the scope of the company itself. We needs to be influenced upon in different manners. We're going to listen to Johan afterwards to see how in Telefonica um, they're working on the supply chain. Next step. We need to think about how companies can adapt because climate change is or well, each fraction uh, affects us. I mean, we've seen this with the snowstorm Filomena in Madrid beginning of the year. It's a question of creating resilience in companies so that people can go back to normal operations. The next step is very important to be coherent, politically speaking. The company is doing incredible things, but what might not work for Telefonica, but it would maybe for Shell and Volkswagen, is to say, well, it should be zero emissions, but when they're negotiating the standards in Brussels, they do a lobby against that same objective. So that coherence is very important because in Glasgow it was clear that civil society, NGOs are very much on top of companies and governments to ensure they walk the talk. And we're going to move to the last point, which is accountability. Companies need to report results in a consistent manner. It should be able to make comparisons and investors and employees and the regulators need 
to look at those results because this is important for employees. I think you're all here on this conference because it's important for you. Investors find it important. They want companies that reduces their risk, that have fewer emissions. And customers are requesting this. And for Telefonica and suppliers of Telefonica, this is a wonderful opportunity. I don't think it's very difficult to reduce emissions in your sector. I work with cement companies and other companies, too, that have a more difficult job ahead of them. And our industry has a huge capacity to reduce the emissions of others through your products. So it's a great opportunity for you. And then finally, regulation is moving in, along, uh, in this direction in Europe and the United States and other big powers. They have to align those objectives with policies. So a company that is prepared and that has done a good job will be a company that will respond a lot better to these new regulations. So. We say to companies that it is necessary to do four things, to have a clear ambition based on science. And if science says that that company in that sector and it says what that company has to do, and they have to be aligned, zero emissions by 2050, which is the same as being in a scenario of 1.5 degrees. And for this, it is necessary to include the supply chain. Secondly, companies need to present their action plans. Many are internal action plans, but many others are with their suppliers and customers. And here I put some of the initiatives. And for example, every 100% they're 100 renewable to have 100% of the fleet that is electrical. And I think that Telefonica can do this easily. Not only can they do it, it would be incredible for the company to set that example in those communities where it operates to show that that transition towards 100% renewables and 100% electric vehicles is possible. And then all types of other initiatives. The third point, it's necessary to be consistent in the way of talking to the regulator. And when we're in business associations where the negative sector it dominates and is against changes toward the plans against climate change or convinces other companies that it needs to ch that they need to change their attitudes because otherwise we're saying to companies that they have to leave the associations and this has been done by Unilever BT and a lot of other companies do this because it's necessary to be coherent and finally accountability we need to start working on that a lot more now because until now everything was promises but we now need to report on the results and what better way to do this is those that will be more highly valued by investors and customers etc one of the initiatives is the SME Climate Hub. And as you can see, Telefonica is one of the companies that supports this. This initiative hopes to bring SMEs in line with the race to zero, that global movement for the reduction of emissions to for zero emissions by 2050. So this platform has been created for this purpose, where we provide tools, calculators, and reporting systems, training programs, and we hope to work a lot more on different markets in order to bring SMEs in those markets uh, closer to solutions and platforms and the necessary education to reduce their emissions in line with what companies and suppliers are requesting. Because what we know is between a 50 or 51 of emissions of companies come from the supply chain and of this at least half come from cement, steel, transport and 
a small part of these companies have been forgotten. And so with this program, we want to ensure that these companies are at the forefront and that they can participate and work with big companies in reducing their emissions because the reduction of the emissions of those companies will benefit all uh, their value chain as well as help for, towards the reduction of telephonic gas emissions. It benefits Telefonica's customers in its uh, carbon footprint. So just to conclude with the next slide, this, this is the last point that I'd like uh, to insist on. The battle of climate change can't be worked, won't be one within the company, but rather it will depend on how companies are able to reduce the emissions in their supply chain. And there will be different ways of achieving this. For example, it will may, it may be possible to do this with other companies in the sector. Uh, they may ask for zero emissions in certain sectors, achieving an adequate amount in demand that may reduce the cost of the products in zero emissions. There's a program called where, where, where there are companies that buy steel with zero emissions. And this sends out a signal to different companies to encourage them to produce that product because there's demand for that product. And then it is possible to work on the climate hub or different mechanisms. But I want it to be clear that you, Telefonica, or the suppliers have your own emissions in the operations, but most of your emissions come from the supply chain, that you two are part of the supply chain of others. So therefore, companies that reduce their emissions most will be much more appealing for customers to be part of their supply chain. And I think that that will be uh, something that creates a lot of innovation and will accelerate the reduction in emissions if there are lots of companies such as Telefonica that are asking their customers to reduce their emissions. And the same is happening with banks who are looking for companies to invest in, companies that um, have a track record in uh, emission reduction. So with that message, I'd like to leave you. And uh, if there are any questions, I'd be only too happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you for that uh, presentation. I think it's a very clear message. And here you're getting an applause. I'm not sure whether you're able to hear that. Anyway, I, we're running late, uh, but I just wanted to mention there's more than 40 suppliers of Telefonica amongst the public. and. The message that you um, conveyed at the end is very important because we increasingly work with suppliers to provide them with support in this decarbonization process to support them, to reward them if possible. So I'd like to, I mean, we've got, you know, suppliers and then suppliers of suppliers, tier two, to it, tier three. So we need to work with our allies and the first tiers, uh, they need to accompany us in this process. So I'd like to know what experience you're seeing that is most interesting, um, which would help a company like Telefonica to accompany the supplier to foster that sustainability, because the supply chain, our supply chain, and the telecommunications sector is basically very common for the whole sector. But also, we have a lot of suppliers of suppliers, basically. This is the idiosyncrasy of the sector. So how can we encourage those suppliers to join the 1.5 supply chain leaders and other initiatives? What can we do? so that this happens. And now that, there are, that we have suppliers here, what can they do to encourage their suppliers to do that? Well, I think that we need to simplify things for companies in terms of what the fight against climate change means and the reduction of emissions, because a lot of suppliers don't have time or the willingness to 
go into such scientific debates and with a loads of acronyms and abbreviations and it's complicated and they prefer almost not to look at those things because they don't have time. So we need to simplify those solutions for them and give them a very straightforward solution. And secondly, everything that suppliers can do in reducing emissions in the next uh, years will have a benefit for the company, will benefit the company in the reduction of costs as well as the they will be more attractive for customers and that is the main message. This is not a question, I mean this is a uh, 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 business opportunity and it has a great effect. It has to do with values, etc. But above all, it's a great business opportunity. And with the energy crisis, that is very clear. If a company goes uh, to renewables and self-consumption, it will be able to overcome the volatility of energy price rises and hikes. And you're going to have to innovate together and find solutions because in the world in which I work, we're always talking about big ideas, big solutions, but now we have to go from the why and to the what do we do as to how we're going to do it. And in terms of the how, you have a vital role because you're the ones that know the house. So be innovative and we should include that in the objectives that you put uh, forward to your employees. We have to work on that how because I know that when a company has ambitious objectives and conveys them to the workforce, the company always outperforms and does things better and I'm sure that that same thing has happened in Telefonica. So one thing that may seem very complicated when we stop to think about it it will be possible to contribute solutions which will benefit the um, turnover and the profit and loss account. That's great. Thank you very much, Maria. Well, I'll uh, note down all your messages. Thank you very much for your time. This innovation you talked to us about, well, we've been doing this with our suppliers. We've been doing this, conversing and talking about this for the last 12 years to see how we can reduce our carbon emissions. So thanks ever so much for your time, and hopefully we'll see each other on another occasion again. Thank you to all of you. All right, we'll continue with the next presentations. clave para avanzar hacia un futuro más verde. En Telefónica trabajamos para tener la red de telecomunicaciones más eficiente energéticamente. El 100% de nuestro consumo eléctrico proviene de fuentes renovables en Europa, Brasil y Perú. Impulsamos el despliegue de fibra óptica, que es un 85% más eficiente que el cobre, y de las redes 5G, hasta un 90% más eficientes que el 4G. Con nuestros servicios, las empresas han evitado la emisión de 9,5 millones de toneladas de CO2. Hemos emitido el primer bono híbrido sostenible del sector para promover proyectos que beneficien a la sociedad y al planeta. Ahora es el momento de acelerar. Es tiempo de superarse para construir un mundo más sostenible. Great. And next up, we continue with looking for the external vision to keep us on our toes. And we're lucky enough to have with us Johan Falk. I see him here. He'll just join us now shortly. On the big screen, co-founder and head of Exponential Roadmap. Johan has a truly remarkable background. He holds paintings. He's co-credited with the carbon law. Look it up. He really, um, and as a bonus for us, he really understands our sector because he's worked in it. So let's um, sit back and listen to, because he's going to share with us what we need to do to reach our global climate targets. There you are. Thank you, Johan. Can you please start? Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. So, um, what is the difference between linear thinking and exponential thinking? Well, if we take 30 linear steps, that will take us to the end of the room. 
if we take 30 exponential steps, starting with 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, etc., where will that take us? That will take us to the moon. And our brain is not really used to exponential thinking. But we do need exponential climate action and technologies in order to address the climate crisis. So that is a reason, as we can see on the next slide, why we created the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. And that's basically where we bring together tech innovators, transformers and disruptors, taking action in line with the 1.5 ambition, with a mission to have emissions before 2030 through exponential climate action and solutions. So, as on the next slide, we can see it is an accredited initiative to join the UN Race to Zero, and it brings together actors like Google, IKEA, Spotify, Telefonica, of course, but also scientific organizations like the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research. It's independent and anchored in science and put the absolute sharpest requirements on companies. And um, as we can see on the next slide, um, the common mission is to drive the narrative of halving by 2030 because we need to have the laser focus on the first halving the next eight years. And today it represents something like 800 billion US dollars in revenue from these companies. So what is required to reduce the risk for very dangerous climate change on the next slide? Well, science is very clear. We need to halve emissions every decade to reach net zero by latest 2050. And at the same time, we need to protect and restore nature, which works as a protection and a carbon sink for us. And this is called the Carbon Law, launched in 2018, and actually inspired by the Morse Law from the ICT industry. And of course, the first halving is the most important, and there is where we should have all the focus. And how can we achieve that? As we can see on the next slide, we need to reduce emissions in parallel in all sectors. We can't do it sequentially, as you can see. We need to do it in, you know, energy, industry, buildings, transport, food, and nature. And that's something we describe in the Exponential Roadmap, which was launched 2018 and updated a number of times, and which has inspired the global narrative to a pretty large extent. So, what about our industry, the digital industry or the ICT industry, as we can see on the next slides? Can it really halve emissions by 2030? Uh, and at the same time, grow value? I would say yes. Our industry, I would say our industry, because I, I've been working in the digital industry, right? It represents, of course, a small part of the global emissions. 1.4% if you also include um, media, the media industry as well. But it is a very important forerunner. It's already the largest buyer of renewable energy, and it's the first sector which has set a science-based target aligned with the carbon law. So in our industry, where will the reductions come from? Well, of course, a shift to 100% renewable energy data centers, in networks, but we also need to implement that in devices. And we need to move the industry to true circularity, which I see as an even higher uh, challenge. But the first halving is absolutely in reach. So what does it take for a company to align with the 1.5 ambition, as we can see in the next slide? And to stay uh, competitive, because it's about future-proofing your company. Well, it's four things. It's halving emissions by 2030 towards 
net zero by latest 2050 and not apply compensation for that. Investment in nature comes on top of that, but it's not a substitute for cutting the emissions. But it's also about integrating climate deep in your strategy and purpose. It's about drive climate action in society. And it's also about reporting our progress transparently on an annual basis. And this is also what's stated by the UN Race to Zero program. And this is, as we can see on the next slide, represented by these four pillars. So to be competitive, a company should implement a strategy across all these four pillars. It's about reducing own emissions, value chain emissions, uh, integrating climate in strategy, and contributing to transformation in society. So this is, of course, very, very challenging. So what does it take and what is required? As we can see on the next slide, uh, it requires radical collaboration. It requires that we share the absolute best practice and support each other. We are all in the same boat. It doesn't matter if a leading company succeeds if the other one fails. So we need to rethink how we actually are working together much more efficiently. And the Exponential Roadmap Initiative is an action initiative. It's not a pledge initiative. Uh, we move beyond pledges. It's all about action and exponential action. And these are three examples of initiatives driving exponential climate action. The Business Playbook, which provides a guide for companies focusing on sharpness, science, simplicity, which every company uh, can apply to align with the 1.5 ambition with the concrete steps to take. The second one is something called the 1.5 supply chain leaders, bringing together leaders on collaborating on how to cut emissions by 50% in the value chain, in the supply chain, through radical collaboration. And a concrete example is something called the Supplier Engagement Guide, which was launched at COP, which is an open site providing best practices and examples for which companies simply can copy in order to cut time to action to engage their suppliers. The third one Maria talked about, which is a fantastic joint venture together with Women Business and Euro Race to Zero. It's called the SME Climate Hub, provides a one-stop uh, hub for small companies to commit to climate action, to get access to tools, to report and get access to incentives. So these are three concrete examples, which is open for anyone uh, to apply. And uh, now I talked a lot about how we reduce emissions, but actually the digital sector need to keep their house in order and of course cut their own emissions. But the highest the potential is actually to transform other sectors. So if you look at the next slide. Uh, the exponential roadmap which we launched highlight 36 solutions which can take us to the first halving of emissions by 2030, as you can see in all these sectors. And it's of course a scenario but highlights where we see a very strong potential. And um, it's everything from, um, uh, from solar and wind and storage in energy. It's about material recirculation, circularity, refrigeration solutions in industry. It's about space energy management in buildings and so on. Uh, this won't happen automatically. These exist, these solutions, they are scalable. As we can see in the next slide, they need to be scaled exponentially to succeed. And this won't happen automatically. We're talking about uh, four accelerators, four key accelerators which drive exponential growth. And it's finance, 
It is policy, sufficiently sharp policy. It's climate leadership, you know, from companies, cities, nations and citizens. And finally, it is technology and exponential technologies. And I would say we will not succeed without really applying key technologies to scale these solutions. Uh, it's absolutely essential for all of them, I would state. As we can see in the next slide, these are uh, concrete examples of how we need to apply you know, a mix of all these technologies like 5G, cloud, AI, Internet of Things, big data, the big five, basically. So in energy, it's about shifting the system to a decentralized system with renewables, uh, with storage and balancing supply and demand. We all talked about that previously. In industry, it's about uh, moving towards material circularity, but also to enable much higher usage of products. We've been talking 10x, 20x of usage of cars, clothing, buildings, and digitalization is a key there. It's a switch to service-based models, of course, to be able to achieve that. And what about buildings and cities? Well, energy optimization is a tremendous opportunity, also in terms of cooling, ventilation, uh, but also the space management. Most of the space in buildings is unused, and we apply digitalization to be able to, to make that much more efficient. Transportation, you talked about that. It's about sharing, routing, moving to mobility as a service, where you actually can shift between different means of transportation. And it's about using virtual meetings, of course, instead of unnecessary, unnecessary business traveling. And uh, what about food? Well, digitalization can help shift them all towards plant-rich diets, healthy diets, but also reducing waste and creating transparency through the chain. And finally, nature-based solutions. Well, digitalization is essential to enable protection, restoration, and the next generation management of nature to create transparency and enabling uh, the finance of uh, these solutions. So just to wrap up on the next slide, um, what is the mobile industry opportunity? And I would say the digital industry opportunity. It's basically three things. Well, the industry should halve emissions by 2030 across the value chain, and that requires radical collaboration. The second is enabling exponential transformation of all other industries, infusing the digital thinking, anything from industry, energy, transport, building, food and land. And finally, there is an opportunity to actually help influence citizens, companies, cities, to take decisions which are better and good for the climate and nature to become climate leaders. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Johan. I don't know if you can hear it, but everybody's clapping you here yes. in the auditorium. <laughs> Take a virtual clap. Uh, we don't really have any time, but we are going to ask you one question that, that's come in. And it's, it's basically maybe a little bit cynical, but what's the advantage for companies? Why, why is there or how is there a competitive advantage for companies to align and take strong climate action? Well, I foresee that within, you know, one, two, three years, uh, to, 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 to have a strong climate leadership, uh, a climate strategy will become the new business as usual. I can just take, of course, Tesla as an example. What, what is the reason why Tesla is, uh, has an evaluation which is higher than the 10 other biggest car companies? What do you think? Well. The reason, in my opinion, is that their purpose and their strategy is aligned with the future, basically, because we will see a complete shift in all value chains. And in order to be able to grow companies, 
should take the position uh, in the front line and be part of the next generation value chains. So it's not just about fulfilling requirements. I think it's much more about how you drive innovation in this biggest shift of the economy that we will ever see in the next uh, 10 years. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we might get back to you with some other questions. Thank you so much for your time. You. Really inspiring. We've got some homework to do. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, our sustainable financing. Again, we're leaders in the sector as the largest issuer of uh, social and environmental uh, bonds, green bonds. So our next guest, uh, Ray, I see him here. He's just connected. Ray Pinto. Um, he is... Um, Director of Policy at Digital Europe. Ray has a stellar background in, in advising private and the public sector in policy. And today we will have the pleasure of hearing um, how um, regulators, <laughs> among other people, need uh, to work harder to ensure that as a region, we gain that leadership and truly transform our economy to the green and digital economy that we want it to. So Ray, if you hear me, can you please start your presentation? Welcome and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for inviting me here to this excellent conference. I've been watching some of these presentations and they're really getting the message across. And I hope the number one message you get across when you listen here, uh, as being part of Telefonica, you're part of an industry, the industry that will lead to change. Don't forget that. This change that our industry will provide in the twin transition in driving down greenhouse gas usage to make efficiencies possible, that's us. So uh, it's an important thing to remember. What is Digital Europe? Just very quickly, we're a trade association. We're made up of 40 national trade associations across Europe. Uh, we cover a vast range of uh, both digital companies, which is our roots as a trade association, but also digitally trans transforming companies as well. And I've listed some here. Uh, when you think about what, uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, sorry, excuse me, I have got to remember to tell you that. When we go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, why digital? Digital is really the key to what uh, will enact change. You've heard the previous presentations. Uh, I don't have to reiterate it, but you know, when it comes to the role of data in training AI that allows emission reduction to track you know, uh, precipitation across across the planet and its impact upon cities to help business leaders to be able to drive down the CO2 in their companies. Uh, it is digital every step of the way. We hear a lot about why we have to reduce our own uh, footprint. That's important, don't get me wrong. But it's also important to remember that our own industry is improving the capabilities and the efficiencies in the production, distribution, transmission of energy. And as we are innovating, we're innovating upon ourselves, making our own products and services far more efficient. So even though the demand increases more and more on our sector, we are also 
uh, ensuring that our own technologies is driving things down. And there's statistical evidence to prove that. If we go to the next slide, this is a study that, that came out a while ago. Um, and, you know, it, it, was, it firmly uh, pointed out where our own footprint um, is producing greenhouse gases, but how the technology is driving down 20% of global CO2 emissions, uh, the multiplying effect that we have is something that has to be remembered. If we jump to the next slide, we've produced this paper. I hope you get an opportunity uh, to download it from our website, uh, where we brought all the stakeholders together across our membership uh, and beyond our membership. We talked to industry players. We did a deep dive interviews. Uh, just 30 pages of this of this report are uh, examples of case studies where our technologies are playing a vital role in improving their sectors and their industries. And that's an important point to remember in this presentation. Um, we also talk about some key areas that we're advising governments and we're advising society on uh, where the focus needs to be played out. And I'll get to that in a second. We jump to the next slide. Three very small examples. Like I said, we have 30 pages worth. But you can clearly see in a real way how some uh, how pretty large scale, maybe even national level uh, uh, use cases where we saw visible reductions. If you look in Belgium, where I'm based, uh, AI actually helped to increase how renewable energy can be injected into the grid, which is not an easy task. And we need these technologies, these smart technologies to do so. In Rotterdam, uh, there was 50% reduction in carbon emissions uh, just by optimization of route planning. And then when you look at buildings, then 70% reduction in CO2. And buildings, you know, is something that produces 36% of global greenhouse gas emissions and 40% of global energy. Just by tackling that, you're really helping to uh, solve the problem in a long way. And your technologies and the technologies our sector provides can enable to do that. And that's the word that we have to remember. We are enablers, every one of us. And we play a very vital role in allowing the other sectors to get that enable efficiencies and those potential. If we just jump to the next slide. Thanks. There's eight ideas that we cover. There's obviously more than eight ideas uh, that can lead to change. And some of these will be very, very straightforward you know, to you. And I'm not going to read them out. You can, you can uh, you know, look at our report. Um, I don't have a, a lot of time, and I know I'm in between you and, and the, the, the final uh, presentation closure of the meeting. But if I could just call out a couple. Uh, data cooperation is important. Data is going to play an important role if we can unlock it, if we can unlock it at the level of the public sector that has a lot of data uh, and to be able to exploit that data. In the EU, as you know, uh, it's very difficult for the private sector and many players, even SMEs, uh, to understand how they can share their data in what way, which rules they have to comply to and not break. This requires clear guidance. This requires guidance that the member states and the commission and the data protection authorities, you know, need to and can provide. Uh, when it comes to personal data, mixed data sets, uh, or non-personal data, where uh, even there, uh, it's not clear cut on where data needs to be shared. We need to safeguard across the planet, cross-border data exchanges and sharing. Just moving data from Europe to other third countries uh, from the UK or the US, it, it's difficult to do. And that's something we have to solve and expand that globally. And we have to look at some key initiatives that the commission are engaged in, like data spaces that need to be interoperable where we can exploit the data. What will this generate? Not only the efficiencies we need, not only improving the AI to drive down and reduce greenhouse gases, it also will create a massive wealth in new businesses, new business models, and opportunities. Um, if we just jump to the next slide. If we look at this house, this is kind of it in a nutshell. Um, when we talk about 
uh, one of the key uh, areas that is important uh, to accelerate the twin transition, it needs to be setting hard KPIs and targets that we have to achieve. We've seen President van der Leyen's uh, digital compass that has some KPIs in there. Uh, we need to make sure, even at local and regional level in the EU, there are hard targets and KPIs that we task our governments to aim to achieve. We need to enable the regulation. We need to see where and how digital will be central to many different sectors to cause that reduction. Here's some other key areas from training to standards, international standards that need to be recognized, developed, encouraged, that are fit for use and fit for purpose. And of course, investment. And at the moment, there's a lot of investment on the table. Um, you know, Spain itself and many other member states have been given recovery money. We got to help these governments in spending that and, and using our skills and expertise in doing scalable projects that are digital, that can be scaled up national and then across the EU through multi-country multi uh, projects. If we go to the uh, last slide, um, these are just some fun facts from our paper. I'm just gonna leave them up there. Um, there's a lot more uh, stats, of course, that, uh, that the, the uh, uh, paper provides, but I think it becomes you know, quite clear that a lot of these different technologies can play a very important role and uh, many different areas from 5G you know, to IoT is going to drive massive amounts of efficiencies. Um, I'm going to stop there, and, and thank you very much. I know that I only have five minutes, so I don't want to go over, and uh, I can take some questions if, uh, if we have time. Yes, thank you so much. We do have indeed have time for for a question. Um, the question here is: Are the twi is the twin transition going fast enough to reach the EU targets by 2030? What do you think? Do you think we'll make it? What needs to be done? It's not a question of if; it's a question we have to make it. And we're coming from a period that is very compressed where only recently now we've realized that digital is going to be central. Um, to date, though, uh, I have to say, we still are missing digital as a central component in many different regulations. It's creeping in slowly, which is good, but it's still very far away as kind of the uh, first area that officials need to be thinking about uh, to get that change, to hit those 2030 targets. Uh, there's a lot of regulations that are coming out where digital is not even mentioned, and that's not the right way to go. Um, we, as a sector, you, as Telefona, Telefonica, we need to be ambassadors to help these officials to understand where and how digital will play a role. If we can do that, then yes. I think there are some uh, real low-hanging fruit, of course, um, that can help us get there faster, but uh, we don't have an option, actually. And if you've been watching the, uh, the recent COP15, it, it, it can be quite bleak on the task ahead, but it's definitely something we just have to deliver. Well, thank you. Certainly a lot of work for the regulators to do. Just one last question. Is that a picture of a regulator on your final slide? <laughs> thank you so much, Ray, for joining us. Hope to see you in You're person welcome. sometime. Good luck, everyone, and thank you. So we're coming to an end of today's session. Uh, but before we part, I, may I invite our group's Chief Sustainability Officer, Elena Valderamino, to the stage for some final remarks. Elena is driving the ESG agenda within our company. She's making sure that ESG is at the core of everything we do. She is a believer and she makes everybody else believe. Thank you for your time. Hasta luego from me, Elena. The stage is yours. Gracias, Cathy. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias tanto a los... Hello to everybody. Good evening. Thank you to all our speakers. First of all, and I'd like to thank, first of all, I think Kathy and Amaya, who are part of my team. And it, I am a great believer, and I think that everyone here are believers too. 
So I think that we've heard some very interesting talks that have highlighted on the one hand the extent and the challenge of climate change and also the efforts made by Telefonica to be able to stop this, to slow this down with real vision and bravery because as Seneca said, we don't dare to do many things because we think they're difficult but they're difficult because we don't dare to try and do them. So without doubt, this team does dare and to a great extent. So these are messages that we have to take home, I think. So the urgency of climate change and the key role of companies is fundamental to achieve true exponential changes. We try to be, we need to be disruptive to accelerate our de decarbonization. As we know, that time is running out. We need action, action, and more action. So to reach our goal, 1.5 uh, degrees maximum. So the, it is clear that digitization is fundamental to help companies to produce in a different way, to, to go for dual uh, technologies and transitions for a more sustainable future Euro european union with their and the financial markets the european union with their grants digital and green go together so in telefonica what have we managed to do we've reduced our energy consumption by 2.4 percent in the last five years in spite of managing five times more traffic in our network, we've reduced by 61% our direct emissions and indirect emissions also we, so, since twen 2015. Uh, this was 17% in the third category. So we reduced the, we've increased the use of renewable, el um, of electricity renewable uh, in Brazil and here and reach long-term agreements, uh, PPAs, to reduce our consumption of electricity through this plan by 2022. So we will thus benefit from better prices and help countries in their uh, energy transformation. We've reduced by 9.5 ton tons the emissions for through digital solutions in 2020. It was an exceptional year due to directed services and teleworking. We have reached three, um, three billion in sustainable projects and through the issue of bonds and with tremendous uh, effectiveness on the part of the market. So we will have net zero in 2040, including our value change giving support, particularly to SMEs to reduce their, their emissions, reducing our emissions through traffic by 2025 back to 2015. Also, for 2030, we're looking at all the electricity we use in the world to being clean and reduce increase our production of this type of energy in all the countries we're working we want to reduce by 12 million tons of co2 every year thanks to our digital services and also our sg esg financing we want to go over 10 billion euros in the coming years directed at esg so I'd like to talk a little bit about our ESG strategy and how this is built into the company strategy. This company strategy, as I said before, this has to do with the uh, pay or variable pay of our employees. This is a key area where building a digital future and more and more green. And as uh, emphasized by Maya, earlier we are on that path to being zero in waste so in s social we are helping society to prosper through connectivity broadband connectivity and in areas which are not connected in rural areas to to reduce the digital gap through a more accessible technology and also digitization of SMEs. 
in in the G of government, gov good governance, we want to lead with example uh, to create a positive impact in our value chain from our corporate bodies and our commitment to our customers, our suppliers and our employees. We want to move towards co-responsibility, joint responsibility and conciliation. So we have established in terms of gender equality an objective of zero gap for 2050. This means initiating from now a path towards parity both in our governing bodies and in executive bodies. So this is all guided by the sustainable development goals, aware of the importance of digitization, uh, and also uh, thinking of our good rates and our, our results in Dow Jones on sustainability, see our ranking for digital inclusion and digital rights, where we are actually number one in the world. So this has moved us to persevere in this area. We want to do better and better. This is a company which is almost a hundred years old and a pioneer in sustainability. We want to make our world more human, connecting the life of different people. So we take on board our responsibility to improve the connection with the environment, our, with our surroundings with society to find a constructive balance and a fair balance for the coming generations. We know that we won't be able to do this on our own, but this is a job for all of us together because everything is connected. Thank you. The end. Down into an open grave. Is there another way? Is there another way?